Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, today's speaker is Professor Simon Tatt from Edinburgh University. Uh, Simon holds the Chair in Earth Systems Dynamics and Modeling and has done since July 2007. Um, the talk today is um, entitled Modeling and Observing Climate Change. Thanks, Simon. So, my, good, it's a pleasure to visit Microsoft and my aim today is to give a rather general talk where I'm going to outline how climate is modeled, um, talk about some of the predictions that are made using those models. Then I'm going to talk about the issues involved with observing climate change, which then, when you link modeling and observing, allows you to also talk about what might have caused historical climate change. And I'll give some outline how that is done, which is one of the results that one of the results of the last IPCC report, so that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was that it was likely that humans had influenced climate over the 20th century, both globally and regionally. I have put some, as I'm visiting at Microsoft, I thought I'd put some thoughts together on what I think the climate community has in terms of informatic needs, and then provide a summary and a conclusion. Um, feel free to ask questions or interrupt as I go along. Um, and I will move around from time to time. So, it's worth saying that uh, climate modeling has a very long history. The first um, attempts were made in the early 1950s by von Neumann and colleagues using some simplified models. Um, and climate models of, of, of at least the current generation, the current approach, developed from numerical weather prediction models. And these basically take the physical laws as we understand them and apply them to the atmospheric motion. So the climate models are bottom-up models. Nobody sits down and says, ha, ah, this is how we'll model the climate. They say these are the physical things that we think are important. Let's model them. And then out of their interactions comes climate. Uh, it's now very complex. And so my aim is to try and give you a flavor for some of the issues involved in, in modeling them in this talk. So the first thing to say is that climate is a multi-scale problem. This shows that picture, a satellite image of the Earth, uh, one of the geostationary ones. And the point to make is you can see all kinds of scales. So for example, here's a, a frontal system in the northern hemisphere about to hit the UK, I suspect. And the scale of that is several thousand kilometers along the front, a few tens of kilometers across the front. Uh, embedded in there, you can see thunderstorms and so on, which they typically will have scales of 10 kilometers or so. Here's a, here's a convection in of Western Africa, and you can see that has quite large scales of the whole region of convection. But again, as you look in more and more detail, you can see more, that there's more and more details you get down to smaller and smaller scales. So the, the point out of that is that there are lots of things going in the climate system on all scales, from, from meters up to thousands of kilometers. And how do we model the climate system? Well, these are all the various processes and things that we think about. The main method I've written up there is there are lots of things happening. The details uh, you can see here. So, for example, the atmosphere will be split up into, into discretized into various levels and special domains. And I'll talk about that later, but that's part of the thing. The other thing that we have to include in the climate model or the climate system is the ocean. Uh, typically, the, the physics of the climate system would involve interactions between the atmosphere, the ocean, and the surface layers of the land. Of the land. Uh, as models get more sophisticated, we include more and more processes. So, for example, here comes the, here's the energy coming from the sun, evaporating water, and driving the whole system. So, so here, I think, uh, lots of things going on, and I'll explain that in more detail. Here's, here shows the radiation budget of the Earth. The ra solar radiation is a driving driver of the whole climate system. So here you have uh, shortwave solar radiation in the visible, peaking in the visible, but across near infrared and ultraviolet. Shining in, it peaks here in the tropics, uh, then radiating almost equally everywhere, not quite, is, uh, is the Earth as it's warming up. And that's, that's long wave radiation, that's heat radiation. And the, there's a net imbalance where there's more radiation going out from the uh, polar regions and extra tropical regions than there is coming in. And so the atmospheric heat transport has, and the oceanic heat transport has to balance that. 
that's him. So you can imagine there's radiation coming in and in the tropics, that's where it's concentrated, and the atmosphere then moves it around all over the place into the ocean. So what are the components of the climate system? So the, the one that the, I think the field basically started from is the atmosphere. Uh, this is a volatile turbulent flow fluid. Uh, so we model that as a, as a fluid like any other fluid. It's got strong winds. It's chaotic, which means uh, it is sensitive to initial conditions. So small changes in your understanding of the state can lead to big divergences in terms of forecast. It's got clouds, which are obvious, uh, which are important climate feedback. And water vapor. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas and traps heat. And so changes in water vapor will affect the climate. It transports heat, moisture, and any other stuff you put into it. But it's got a very small heat capacity. Its heat capacity is equivalent to about 3.2 meters of water. So as an example, the ocean is several thousand meters deep in some places. And so the atmosphere, the, the, the amount of energy stored in the atmosphere is very small. So let's come on to the next great thing is the ocean. So this is... Uh, covers 70% of the earth. It's wet. It's a great source of water for the atmosphere. Uh, it's also has a fluid. It's probably easier to see that. It's got a very high heat capacity and it also stores, it stores energy, moves heat and fresh water and gases and chemicals around its circulation. And it adds a delay because it is the bulk of the heat capacity of the system of 10 to 100 years to the response time. So the at the moment, because the ocean is still taking up heat, the planet is in disequilibrium. So we're not in equilibrium with the changes in greenhouse gases. So other components of the climate system are the land, which has a very small heat capacity, so small stores hardly any energy, doesn't have very much mass involved either in terms of the actual bit that's coupled into the system. Um, how its ability to store water varies from place to place, and this affects the sensible, which is the uh, just heat versus latent fluxes, which is moisture. So if you can imagine a soil that's saturated, when the sun shines on that, that will evaporate when the soil, and so the temperature won't rise because all the energy is going into evaporating the water. But when the soil's dry, the same amount of radiation will cause an increase in temperature because the energy goes into temperature rather than evaporating water. Uh, it's got a wide variety of features, slopes, vegetation, soils, etc. It's very heterogeneous. It's got some natural and it's got some managed and it's vital in the carbon cycle and in the water cycle and ecosystems and of course it's where we live so we care about it a lot from the point of view of climate. Um, the other thing that's important in climate models or earth system models is, is ice. This has a huge heat, heat capacity, uh, provides very long time scales so we're getting worried that there might be some fast time scales because of the time it takes heat to diffuse through, through the ice sheets. It's got a high albedo, and there's an ice albedo feedback. And the ice albedo feedback is if you imagine snow or ice sitting there, lovely and white, shining, reflecting solar radiation back to space. If you melt some of that ice or snow, then the ground underneath will be, or the sea underneath will be darker, and so the system will absorb more heat. And that's a positive feedback and can cause more warming than you might think. Um, changes, the ice is a huge store of fresh water, particularly the ice sheets, and, uh, and so any changes in ice volume will have impacts on sea level. And the, the big ones are the Antarctica, which stores 65 meters in total. The West Antarctic ice sheet has four to six meters of global sea level equivalent. Greenland has about seven meters of uh, sea level equivalent. So all of Greenland melted, that would cause sea level to rise by seven meters. And the other lots of small glaciers and small ice sheets store 0.35 meters, so quite small. Not negligible, but small. So those are the main components of the climate system, and I like to show some equations from time to time. So meteorology, is, which is the atmospheric study, but ocean, oceanography is not terribly different, is roughly fluid dynamics in a rotating sphere. Um, I mean, the point of showing these equations, beyond the fact that sometimes I like to remind myself I did maths once, is to remind people that there are, that the basic principles that underlie particularly the atmosphere and oceanograph atmospheric dynamics and ocean oceanographics are well understood and have been known for a long time. And actually the issue is how you make reliable predictions from this. And I'll explain a little bit about that later. So that's, that's just to show uh, we have some mass underlying all this. We don't just make it up. So now there are no known analytical solutions to these equations. Like many other complex systems equations, there has been suggestion that we might get, uh, using something called maximum entropy production, some solutions in terms of the climate system, but I've yet to see any reliable demonstration of it. And I think actually that's not terribly surprising because you just think of the range of phenomena in weather ranging from being held on as you 
cycle to work here at Microsoft to the lovely sunshine I believe you sometimes get. I've never heard it myself. Um, and so I think that, that maybe that, that's why there are no that simple analytical solutions to these because just the range of phenomena that can be generated by these equations that we see in the real world are so large. There is nothing simple about it. Um, so what we actually do, how do we my community solve it? Well, it, it discretizes these equations of motion in the grid and formally that means replacing uh, differential operators with difference operators. Um, and it's, of course, very easy to say you do that. In practice, it's quite hard. There's quite a lot of things you have to worry about. Why well, you would like the discrete versions of those equations of motion to conserve the same properties as the continuous properties. There are lots of ways of doing this and various being explored. Two major ones that are used at the moment. And that's not to say they will be in the future. Uh, the, in fact, the largest one is in which these equations, the data is represented as a truncated sum of spherical harmonics, which has some advantages for some of those continuous operators, uh, or as used uh, in the UK at the Met Office where I used to work, as values at points or averages over a regular grid. And I'll, I'll show that. No, I won't. I'll, yes, I'll skip ahead and then come back to that and to demonstrate. There we go. So that's, that's, that's the kind of thing. So the space, uh, space is broken up into volumes, essentially, and the equations of motion are solved in each of those. Let me hop back. So, okay, so the problem with a discretized solution is you have got processes which are occurring below the resolution of your grid. And in a linear system, that's fine. You don't need to worry about that. But unfortunately, I mean, the equations of motion aren't linear. So if you recall the equations of motion, you basically have these kinds of terms. And if you split those into what is a large-scale average, that's the bar, and a residual, the residual from that large-scale average, a prime term, because there, there's essentially non-linearities, you find uh, an expression on the large scale that implies that, that comes from these small scale, these residual terms, their correlations, which basically means that the large scale flow is influenced by the flow that you don't represent directly in your model. So that's, an, that's a really quite important point. I, would, I, will, I will come back to that a bit and I'll expand on that in a while. So, so large-scale terms, so the stuff that you are trying to model, arises from small-scale stuff. And that is, that is the problem in climate modeling. At the end of the day. Um, the, the big term is the, I mean, the one you're most concerned about is that third term, right? I mean, obviously, the first term is big. The second term shouldn't be because there's small changes. Well, about the yeah. the, the, this, these terms here, the V prime, the, the, well, though this might be small, the this term here might not be. Yeah. Well, it, and also how they, how they're, it's because it depends on the gradient. Yeah. If the gradient is. Oh, okay. yeah. And because it, and also it actually depends on, on all kinds of horrors like the correlation structure of these things as well and how they couple up. So the, the point I'm trying to make, I don't know if I've succeeded, is that the, the large-scale flow has terms in its budget that depend on, on the small-scale stuff. But you don't, in a discretized model, you don't represent. So you've got to do something about it. So and this is called, this in, in, in our biofield is called parameterization. I don't know if any of you are familiar with fluid dynamics, where essentially this is a similar class of problem. Um, it's, it's the, uh, the analogy is the closure problem for fluid dynamics. And the same issues. In, in fluid dynamics, how do you represent the effect of the eddies on the mean scale, large scale flow? And you don't want to represent those eddies directly. But, so. Okay, so in climate, the key processes are convection, and convection is when uh, parcels of water rise up and release lots of energy because the water in them condenses. Uh, and that's one of the biggest drivers of the climate system. Okay. Clouds in general, because clouds are occurring on scales below the, the scale of which the model is is acting generally. Boundary layer, so what happens when you're flowing, when you've got flow near the surface of the Earth, and the need to simplify radiation calculations into what a relatively num small number of rather broad bands. I mean, you don't want to do calculations for individual photons and do the individual absorption for uh, individual frequencies as they, as they move through the atmosphere. So again, you have to make some approximations for this. Um, this, at least, has the advantage you can verify the calculations of these broadband approximations by direct by comparison with very high resolution calculations, where you're doing the calculations as exactly as you can. 
um, and friction. And the, the story here, from a software point of view, is there are many specialists that will work in each area. So there will be specialists that concentrate on boundary layer parameterizations and how you represent those in terms of a large-scale flow. And so an atmospheric model trying to do weather is a complex piece of software, because it has all these things joined into it, uh, built by particular specialists. And the numerical methods do dynamics in terms of preserving the various properties you would like them to preserve, like conservation of mass, not, uh, not losing stuff, and things like that are quite complex as a consequence. So this is a picture of the parameterized processes as opposed to some words. So here's, here's convection. So convection involves parcels of air who are unconditionally unstable sitting there and realize if they go up a bit, they, they weigh less than their surrounding vault, than the, so they have less density than the surrounding air, so they will keep rising until their density is the same as the, the air. Okay, that sounds good, except because they've got water in them, what happens is they move up, they cool down, the water, water, wa the water that can condense, the water condenses, which then releases energy into the parcel, which means the parcel there warms up. Therefore, it's less dense, and so on. So it can actually go all the way to the top of the atmosphere. That dominates why we get the, the, the lower atmosphere, 10 to 12 kilometers high. So that's an important process to make. That drives probably the general circulation of the system. Uh, we have shallow convection when the parcels don't go up so far. Here's sort of pictures of radiation. So here's incoming shortwave radiation from the sun, and it's affecting the ocean. And there's a long wave, which is the, the heat going back up to space. Here, here are the effects of clouds on very small scales. So typically, clouds are one to one to ten kilometers. And so, some places we get sheets raining. Uh, you have to parameterize the effects of uh, f turbulent diffusion of uh, friction or turbulent diffusion at the surface. Uh, what happens when flow grow goes over mountains and it generates some interesting waves, which do some mixing up there. So, there's there's all these processes which essentially need to be rep represented one way or another. So, and. In general, the parameterizations are simpler versions of reality. So this is a satellite image of um, some large-scale thunderstorms, I think, over the tropical Pacific. And you can see there are lots of things going on in there. And typically, the way this would be represented in the model is this kind of thing. So the sort of much simpler version of that, because this has to be represented in terms of large-scale flow in the model. So one of the reasons I wanted to discuss these parameterizations is to say that so uh, the one, one way you could think about a climate model world is, you know, we know the physics. It's 19th, early 20th century physics. Hey, you know, people have done that for years. Uh, and you can put those in computers. But the problem is you've got to represent these processes, which you can't explicitly resolve with today's computer or even computers in the next 50 years. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about how you best do that. And that's, that's where the uncertainties in climate predictions come from. So, a good way of thinking about climate change is to think about feedbacks. And feedbacks will act to amplify or decrease warming from changes in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And so what this slide does is lists the feedbacks. So the important one that is actually a negative feedback is a black body feedback. So a warmer planet emits more radiation, busy trying to cool itself down, and that's a negative feedback. And then we have a whole set of other feedbacks which generally are positive, so amplify things. So in fact, if I skip to the bottom, ice albedo feedback, it's really easier to understand that, the concept of feedback there, and then I'll go through the left. So the, the thing to think about here is ice is white. Okay? And so if you melt ice, you can, the, the planet will absorb more solar radiation and warm up, which in turn will cause planet, a warmer planet, will result in more ice melting, and so on. So, so that, that's, a, that's the easiest uh, example of a feedback to think of, but there are other important feedbacks. So... Uh, um, really important feedback is water vapor. So a warmer atmosphere can store more water vapor and for very basic physical reasons. Water vapor is an absorber of infrared radiation and so acts like a greenhouse gas. It's a, it affects, it's just like carbon dioxide. In fact, it's a better greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Its effect is most important in the upper troposphere, so with water vapor high up there. And the story is a warmer world, more moisture, and traps more heat, which in turn warms the world up, and so that's a positive feedback. And clouds, well, we're unclear as to whether they're positive or negative. So oh, there's a positive feedback, and they act like water vapor. They trap infrared radiation. If you get more clouds, if they're high enough, those, those trap infrared radiation, so it causes the planet to warm, which in turn warms the planet, causes more clouds, and so on. Or there's possible they're negative feedback because they're white, and they reflect short-wave solar radiation back to space and cool the planet. 
So the, so, so the aim of, say, some climate models, one thing you might want to look at the climate model is to see, well, what are the feedbacks and how do they all work? But I'm not going to say very much of this. Another feedback, which isn't a physical one or atmospheric one, is the carbon cycle. This shows some results from uh, a set of carbon cycle models showing the additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which range from 250 parts per million, which is an awful lot, down to nearly zero parts per million, which just arose from the feedbacks between climate change and the carbon cycle, in particular the ability of the land to store carbon and the consequences of an additional 250 parts per million of carbon dioxide are, are quite large. Okay, so, so that's a sort of general overview of, of the components of model, model. So I've talked about the, the fact that there's basic equations of motion, and that, but we need to discretize those equations of motion, and so there are subgrid processes that aren't explicitly represented, and that's how parameterization. So people have actually been thinking about doing, um, particularly weather forecasting, for a long time. And this is, this is Richard, L.F. Richardson was a Quaker person who worked for the Met Office in 1910 and came up with the idea of doing numerical weather prediction. And he imagined, he did this, he, he had a first go while sitting in the trenches, I believe, in the First World War. And he imagined that, that and this, these were the days before we had um, uh, machine computers, but there were computers, they were just people. And he imagined a whole load of people who would have the work distributed to them for each region solving the equations of motion, advancing it forward step by step. And here with these guys in the center telling them, hey, you're too slow, speed up. Hey, you're too fast, slow down. So they're all kept in synchronicity. So I guess that's another historical idea that people have been thinking about um, modeling the atmosphere for a long time. So I showed you this, but I'll go through it again. So how do we actually do it? So here we, we break uh, space. And this is a, a, quite an old slide, uh, models are slightly higher resolution these days. We break space up into volumes. We solve the discretized equations of motion on each cell. So information and data gets passed around between these two calculations. And the various processes are all represented um, and model steps forward. So the way we simulate climate is basically we simulate weather and ocean flow and everything else 15 minutes at a time. Pardon? Yes. So, yeah. The global climate models have scales of about 150 to 200 kilometers. So I'm going to have to turn that into miles. So 100 to 150 miles or so is a, is a sort of extension of these grid boxes. It depends. Near the surface, a couple of hundred meters, probably 100 to 200 meters in the boundary layer, in the free atmosphere, several kilometers in, in the... Upper, upper atmosphere, they may not be represented at all, or tens of kilometers. <sighs> Let me think. Um, probably about 30 kilometers, I'd say, for current models. Depends on the model, actually. Um, all the way to the bottom. Um, but again, there are many more layers near the surface of the ocean than at the bottom. So you, I think typically the top 100 meters will probably have five layers in five five layers, uh, but there's about 20, 20 to 40 layers in current models to represent the whole 4,000 kilometers of the ocean. Um, and this shows for a model that's about one generation old, just because I have the slide, the sort of land sea mask. And in fact, here's the levels for the, for the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, I've asked you a question, answer the question. One of the cunning things is the coordinates of terrain following near the ground and uh, our um, height or equal pressure as you get higher up. So that's all, and then you can see the density. But that gives you a feel for the kind of grids that global models have. And more recent models have grids that say have double the resolution. But still, that's a long way away from being able to see things. And I just blow up Europe just to show you can do that. So, OK, so I talked briefly about chaos when I began. So chaos limits the predictability of weather. Um, here shows an example of this for a very simple set of equations of motion which are vaguely re relevant to climate uh, and that's just those three cases. So here's one where you set, start out with a set of uh, initial conditions here and they trap forward in time and they kind of stay together so that's, that's one where you've got some good predictability. Here's one where they trap forward in time and spread out quite a lot so you don't have so much predictability and here's one where you start here and they go in all kinds of directions and you have no predictability and, and this, so that's a theoretical idea 
really simple model. This shows uh, ensembles of, climate, of uh, weather forecast, weather forecast, weather forecast. So they all start together, and then you can see with, as time spreads, they go all over the place. And, and so they start. You can see they, they they start very very close together. So, and the point here is that the the models, and we therefore are inferring the real world, is very sensitive to initial conditions. And so memory in the atmosphere of where you were is lost, say, after 10 to 20 days in detail. So, and that leads to kind of the whole idea that models are producing um, some stochastic variability with time. So you're, or at least we model it as stochastic variability. Um, but in fact, for future predictions, the biggest, un the, bit, the, the uncertainty that comes about comes from our un lack of understanding of how to model these subgrid scale processes and their effect. So this shows from the last IPCC report, the how, this is the observations and this is the range of models run through the 20th century, which all do quite well. And then there are several different scenarios for the future, uh, rate depending on what we think people might choose to do or what global society might do uh, in terms of its development. The, none of these scenarios involve uh, any any actions taken in response to concerns about changing atmospheric concentrations, carbon dioxide, and the climate effect. That's it for this one. So this is, this is a high one, and the range of model predictions for the future of global warming by 2100 is between 3 and about 4 degrees. Okay? And then another scenario has less warming and less warming. And you can see the range of uncertainty in those. Is that, that's the range across the, the different climate models that were run for that period. Here is what would happen if carbon dioxide concentrations were stabilized today. Well, actually in 2000, so we're already on that. Um, so what that's showing is that the climate still has got warming to come. So even if uh, carbon dioxide concentrations were, were stabilized, there was no more carbon dioxide going to the atmosphere, the planet would still warm. So climate change is going to happen regardless now. Okay? Now, you can do something more sophisticated by comparing these models with observations. You can actually come up with a range of uncertainty as to what the future might hold which tries to look beyond just those individual models. And that's what this, these bars show here. And so on one very high scenario, which isn't included in the range of models, ones were predicted today, warming might be coming up to two and a half or so, up to more than six degrees. Under the highest scenario, well, on the lower scenarios, might be between one and, uh, one, that's one, isn't it? Yeah, one and three degrees centigrade. So that's in terms of global warming. So the, the, the picture here is that there is uncertainty because we don't know what uh, choices people, the global society will make in the future. And there's also uncertainty that comes from our, mis our lack of understanding about how the climate system works in detail. Okay, and you can convert those into predictions of future changes in climate. I think this is, from the, this is averaging all the, mo the models that were run. So these are three different scenarios. So that's the B1, A1, B, A2. Don't worry too much about those. This is in 20, the sort of 2020s. So the near future, and this is the end of the century. And the general picture is that the, the patterns that these things show is actually quite similar. Generally, more warming at high latitudes. Um, under, and if you go to very strong if scenarios where there's lots of change in carbon dioxide, you get very strong warming. Intriguingly, you get least warming here in the North Atlantic and in the Southern Ocean. So that's a general picture. Uh, and this just gives you a feel for the we make projections. Uh, Going beyond temperature, one can talk about precipitation, and, and rainfall is quite important to people's ability to do agriculture and useful things. And we'll see this. You can see here, so this is rather complicated. So this is, one, this is the A1B, which is the mid-ranking mid scenario. The, this is the average of all the, models, of all the models that were available to the IPCC. The red colors are where you've got an increase. Purpley, blue, blue purpley colors is an increase in rainfall. This is winter, northern hemisphere winter on the left, northern hemisphere summer on the right. And he, so where it's stippled, the, all the model, most of the, the models all agree. So you can see models are all agreeing that in winter, in northern hemisphere, generally there'll be an increase in rainfall. Uh, here in the subtropics around the Mediterranean, they're all predicted, there's a general prediction of decline. In the mid, mid, in the equatorial regions, a reduction and so on. So there's a there's a reasonably consistent story emerging of large changes to the hydrological cycle of, with, say, rainfall changes, reduction of 20% or so in some places in winter and increases of 20% in winter in other regions. And if we look in summer, we can see this sort of Mediterranean drying seems to be a rather consistent pattern 
here and other drying regions over southern Africa and so on. So that's the, that's the sort of state of the art in terms of climate modeling is to use all models. So let me very quickly talk about observing climate change. Oops, sorry. I think about 15 or so, but some of those will be the same models but run with different initial conditions. So probably order 10 models went into that analysis. 10 independent models. Um, I don't think it's that simple. I think the reasons for the decline here is that the, that the atmospheric circulation descends so over here, so it tends to suppress rainfall. And I think that gets stronger and expands in summer. And with a wet, a warmer world, the atmosphere can cold more water and then dumps it. So, well, some of this is the circulation. Some of this is is a warmer world. Simply, the system can transport more water. Some of it is atmospheric circulation is changing as well. So, where the where the where the atmosphere where where the water goes changes. It turns out that the chaotic components, so the bit you can't predict on large scales, is quite small compared to the, the, the component that's driven by forcing. So the overall effect of carbon dioxide to warm the world dominates the chaotic atmospheric and oceanographic stuff. Does that help that? Ice, whoops. Where have I got to? Whoops, I've gone to all my talk. Right, let me just, I'm going to say very quickly something about observations and then talk about detection and attribution. I think I'm running, I'm taking more time than I thought I would. Um, so, well, I think I want to finish at half past. So, the, so, the pro, so the, what is the problem with observing climate change? You know, you just gather data, you stick it together. It's easy, isn't it? I mean, that's, and the reason actually it's difficult is the climate changes slowly compared to the, the way the observed system changes. And if it was the other way around, it'd be fine. And so these are just some images of that. Here's, diff here's uh, one way in which temperatures used to be measured in the tropics, and they're now measured like that, and that includes some biases. Sea surface temperatures have been measured in a variety of ways using these elegantly positioned buckets. They used to be measured with that. This is an insulated bucket. They can also get measured by water coming into the engine intakes of ships. So, so all of those introduce some biases which need to be corrected for. And you'd think, well, hell, shouldn't we know better? Well, here's the satellite data. And the actual time of day in which the satellites are making observations has changed by quite a lot over the past, over the past year. So here's the, this satellite set. It was launched in 1989 and started, looking, it started making measurements at 1 o'clock in the afternoon local time. And by the end, the end of its mission, it's making observations at 8 o'clock in the evening. And because the temperature of the Earth varies during the day, that introduces a bias that isn't a climate change signal, but are just the bias of the way the observing system is working. And so that's the problem with observing climate. Um, and so when you go off and correct for that and stick things together, you can produce these kind of things. And this is from the IPCC and work that I contributed to. And that's why you get uncertainties on, on observations of climate change, basically. And we don't have a continuous record. So the little black spots are the individual temperature values for a given year. The blue line is the long, low frequency smooth series, and the yellow bars are the uncertainties on that smooth series. Now, the nice thing about this date record is that the uncertainties we think are quite relatively small compared to the change. Um, and you can see if the, if it looks like the rate of temperature change has accelerated. But the general story is the world is now, say, 0.8 degrees or so warmer than it was at the end of the, in the, end of the 19th century. That's a big change. And the, it turns out, for people who like these kind of records, that the warmest 12 years have basically been occurring since, hmm, 19, since 1995, with one exception of 1990. So again, we're seeing a, a very rapidly changing climate system. And one of the jobs that I used to have in my previous job was to communicate uncertainties to people. And this is a diagram put together by my colleague John Kennedy that basically ranks 
each year by its best estimate and then shows the uncertainties on that temperature change. And again, you can see the, the reds are the most recent 10, 10 15 years are up here on the left, left hand side, but there are quite considerable uncertainties. And so one of the things people seem to get quite excited about is statements that such and such a year was the warmest year in record. But that's only something you can state in a probabilistic way. And, and relatively small changes in temperatures by a couple of hundredths of a degree may change records. And so people shouldn't get too excited about temperature records. So I think I will go and just show you this. So this shows the, the fact that climate has warmed. This shows temperature changes in, over the surface. So this is a map rather than the time series. And you can see a general picture of warming, except possibly here around, uh, or of these are Kel this is the trend from 1901 to 2005. So you can see generally everywhere is warming, with a few exceptions, one being parts of the United States down here and some of the waters off Greenland. Where the little blue crosses, those changes are significant. So you can see generally most warming is significant. Lots of warming across the high, lat high, lat high latitudes in North America and Eurasia. Uh, here's the troposphere, so the lower bit of the atmosphere. Now the weather happens, and that's also been warming from 1979 to 2005, because of when the satellite data is available. Uh, and there are records from the oceans. And though they show quite a bit of decadal variability, in general, lots of energy is being stored in the ocean and has been over the past 50 years or so. And this is extremely unlikely without any external drivers, any external forcings. And as I'll show you, it's very unlikely due to any known natural causes. Uh, one last thing to show you in terms of observations is sea ice. And the rather dramatic results this year where basically half of the Arctic sea ice has disappeared. And this wasn't, this is unexpected from, on the basis of our current understanding and current models, we weren't expecting this much sea ice loss at this time. Um, and does this suggest we're missing something fundamental in our understanding of the Earth system, uh, which would sort of limit our ability to make predictions of what's happening? And this rather complicated diagram shows time series of the Arctic sea ice extent from 1950 through to 2007 in a million kilometers squared. And so you can see it, it's slowly declining, but here you can see 2007 with a massive reduction down there. You see that? So, the, so we, something's happened in the Arctic, and I don't think we're quite sure what. Um, I will actually go and skip this, du, 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 except to say that we, there are new ways of getting observational data. Um, basically, to, to make these data sets and so on, the data needs to be available in a digital form so it can be processed. Um, there's observed weather data are quite limited before 1950 and almost non-existent before 1850. But there are observations of the, on paper that people made which have digitized we could improve the climate century, the climate record, and my colleagues in the Hadley Center. Uh, this shows some of the results from 1900 to 2000 uh, of some analysis of sea surface temperature. And you can see there's, there's large amounts of data missing in the 1940s. I think this is in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we digitized some more data for World War II, and hey, presto, we can fill in the gap. So what that tells you is one might be able to improve our knowledge of past climate by generating new observations from, from, digital, from handwritten records. So let me talk a little bit about what might have caused observed change. And what I'm going to do is go through the list of possible factors that might drive climate and then show you the consequences of that and how we do it. So the natural factors that might affect climate are volcanoes. This shows the eruption of Pinatubo, a volcanic eruption in 1991. Uh, their effect is to inject sulfuric um, SO2, sulfuric dioxide, into the stratosphere. It forms little, air, little droplets of sulfuric acid which cool the planet down. They reflect sunlight back into space. Um, and you can, this, this plot here shows the variation in time estimated of the volcanic aerosol. So you can see quite considerable variations in time. Uh, one thing you should notice is that the more recent period, around to up to 2000, is quite volcanically active. And so you'd expect naively, well, that in itself might cool climate a bit. Well, everyone likes this one. This is the sun. So the, the solar irradiance uh, might, might have changed. And there's certainly good evidence of um, a link between solar activity, so that's sunspots and the sun doing exciting things, and uh, energy reaching the Earth over the 11-year solar cycle, and that's measured from space. Um, there are long-term changes in solar activity. So here's a period, I think, in the late 19th, in this, uh, this period here, when there's almost no sunspots, uh, uh, the late Maunder minimum being one example. 
And so people have converted these changes in activity to changes in, in radiation and heat from the sun based on all kinds of sun-like stars. And a general point I'd make is that's quite uncertain. It's really not very certain how, you, what the, how the sun's activity is varied. It's not sun's activity. The radiation from the sun reaching the Earth has changed over the last 500 years or so. And people who claim it is aren't telling you the truth. So let's talk about human factors that might have affected climate. Well, the obvious one is greenhouse gases. Um, and we have good observations of, from flasks carried out in Mauna Loa and Hawaii since the late 50s which show an increase in carbon dioxide concentrations from about 320 parts per million to coming up to 380 parts per million. I think we're getting quite close to 400 now. Um, and then people have done some very clever thing looking at ice cores and reconstructed green, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations back to, seven, to 1700 and beyond, which suggests that pre-industrial concentrations are about 280 parts per million. But the carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. Uh, methane is just another example of that, and that's also changed. So that's one thing that might have affected climate. And the other thing that might affect climate is, is aerosols coming from burning of coal. So when uh, people used to burn coal before they put scrubbers on their stacks, the sulfur dioxide, a lot, a lot of sulfur dioxide would be emitted into the free atmosphere. Some of it would fall down as acid rain and do nasty things. Uh, but while it was in the atmosphere, it would form uh, essentially clouds. It would also affect the properties of clouds and of existing clouds and make them brighter. So the overall effect of aerosols being emitted for, by humans was to cool the planet. So there are all these possible things that might affect climate. And the way you decide, well, what's important is you effectively say, well, you know, you've only got one view, one realization of what's happened in the Earth from the measurements. But if you take climate models and derive them with these terms, you can essentially isolate the individual effects of the drivers. And by comparing what you think best happened with observations, you can actually give yourself some faith in the ability of models to work. So this shows, here's the experiment when you put all the four things in, a, in, in climate models, and that's a whole load of different climate models. The black is the observations. You can see that models are doing a pretty good job of reproducing that. And if you just put solar and volcanic forcing in, you get this, and you don't do a particularly good job of reproducing what happened. And so you can do something slightly more sophisticated to get better results, but the general story is that. But if you put everything in together, you do a good job of reproducing what happened. If you just put natural stuff in, you don't do a good job of reproducing what happened. And this shows this uh, for various continents, uh, different models, and the story is pretty much the same. Uh, in, every, in these continental size, continental scale regions, you need human influences, human human contributions, human drivers to explain what's happened. And so that's why the last IPCC result said it was likely that there was a significant anthropogenic contribution over the last 50 years. Do you find, since you've done this on a continent by continent, yeah. uh, do you find that the, uh, that there's a difference in the amount of anthropogenic forcing required in different continents? And does that correlate with industrial development? Yeah, well, what you find, and it's probably just about possible to make out here, um, is that aerosols have had their strongest effects here in northern, in these northern regions. So there is, there are differences between regions, uh, but in fact, I think the story is actually generally rather coherent. I mean, the, the atmosphere is very good at mixing heat around. It's, it's really the point. Yeah, no, no. Well, particularly carbon dioxide gets transmixed across the, uh, across the whole atmosphere very quickly uh, and is long-lived, so it's, its effect is pretty much the same everywhere. Aerosols have a very short lifetime and don't go far from where they're emitted, so they have a cooling effect locally. Sorry, that, that was really your point, I think. Okay, so that was, that was talking about some science issues, and I was visiting Microsoft, and I thought I would some, put some thoughts about informatics issues really to provoke some conversations or discussions with you to see if there are areas where you can help. So the issues actually, I think, aren't so much high-performance computing. If you'd asked me what was required 10 years ago, I'd have talked about high-performance computing, but I don't think they are anymore. So climate models are getting increasingly complex. There are more and more and more processes being added to these models, and they're becoming Earth system models. Um, and generally, current climate models have been developed by operational agencies, so places like the Met Office 
or so, well, places where people are essentially employed to develop those models and use those models and not do anything else. But with an increasingly academic community that isn't operational, and therefore doesn't think about software quality to quite the extent that operational agencies do, I think they have problems. So, so the issues, I think, are how you bring all this software together in a useful way to make a complex model do something useful as opposed to just chucking the software in together or not, and how to persuade academics to produce high-quality code so that others can build on their work. And I suspect that's something I see some smiles in my friends. And actually, I think partly it's a social change that the metric of academic success needs to be more than a paper and a journal, really, is part of the issue. Um, there's also the sort of need for technological support with the infrastructure to support distributed software and scientific development. So in particular, the institution I'm part of is part of a grand consortium involving several universities across Scotland. So the problem we have is how do we bring together the contributions from people that are spread across all of Scotland, where we don't necessarily want to spend all our life traveling to visit them. Uh, model development. So, so the Earth system models are in hugely complex bits of software. Um, uh, we don't know what the outcome should be either. If we did, we wouldn't be building the system in the first place. So we're, we're interested in the emergent properties of that system. Not so, but these models need tuning where, where parameters in the various components are adjusted so that you get a reasonable simulation of base climate. The model behaves reasonably well, does good weather forecast if it, at least that part is tested. But tuning and building these models is, is, is extremely hard, and very laborious. And I mean, by experience of the Hadley centers, it involved tens of my colleagues over several years to build a climate model. And I think that's, that's something. And so my one question is, are there good ideas in the informatics community about how this might be done better? Are these the kind of problems you're tackling with? And what is actually an old problem, drinking from the fire hoses? I, I remember it being called when I was a graduate student. It's, Certainly an old issue. It's been around for 20 plus years. I think it's getting worse. The next genera new generation satellites and supercomputers will produce enormous amounts of data. But the challenge is actually how to efficiently turn, as I put it, petabits bits into knowledge. Uh, policy people don't care about bits. They kind of want to talk about, well, what, should we, what are the consequences of this particular action? And I think that's, in a way, what the scientific community is doing to do. And the way forward is to ask right and relevant questions of the data to turn it into something useful. Again, are there good software systems that would help with this particular problem? I think my community is probably reasonably advanced on dealing with the vast amounts of data. So computational issues, well, there is this question of how to effectively use massively parallel computers. Earth system models tend to run for decades with relatively low resolutions. They, don't, they tend not to scale very well on these large parallel computers that are the next generation of supercomputers. Yep. That's the time period you are simulating. Not yeah. The yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, they, they will typically run for months to do that. Okay, okay. Just checking. Uh, oh, that's a good point. Yes, and the same, the same issue is true about multi core chips, which is the next generation of, of, of um, commodity chips, where the issue is actually memory bandwidth. Can you get the data from memory fast enough to keep the computer busy? I have uh, some of my colleagues in physics build specialist chips. I wonder if we should have specialist or system computing chips. A big, big issue is data management and data distribution. And the last IPCC report based heavily on this multi-model analysis. And a group at Lawrence Livermore National Labs handled that data distribution. Uh, and that's a, a good example. And so let me summarize and conclude five minutes ago. So models are complex. They're complex beasts. They're built bottom up. So the way we do climate is by taking physical systems, biological systems, and coupling them together with our base bottom-up understanding. Then what we ask the questions are is what emergent phenomena has come out of this system. The uncertainties arise from imperfect knowledge of small-scale processes and how to model them in terms of large-scale flow. Of course, if Donald Ron's not were here, he'd remind me that there are things we don't know we don't know. So there are processes we've we don't know we should include in these climate models or processes we thought are unimportant. So they're not included at all. So, that's another source of uncertainty. There's clear evidence of climate change in the observational record. I don't think you will now find any credible scientist who would say that the climate has not changed over the last century. Um, and these are despite the uncertainties which come from changes in observational practice. And it's likely that these changes are due to human influences. And 
So it's again clear. I think you'll find very hard pressed to find a credible scientist in the field who would now say, mm, I don't think people have changed climate. Uh, and there are lots of climate issues which I've just highlighted. So thank you very much. Okay. Okay, there's about 10 or so actually, there used to be more. Um, it, building these models is essentially a job done by um, large centers. So I think in the United States, the two big ones, the three big ones are the Goddard Institute of Space Studies in New York, Geophysical Dynamics Lab at Princeton, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. So that's, that's the US's climate model, as, as, I mean there are other ones around. Um, in the UK, there is essentially one model developed by the Met Office. The French and Germans have their own models developed out of their own weather prediction code. I think there's two from Japan and one from China, one from Australia. So it's they're ba basically building, partly because the climate models evolve out of weather forecast models. And so groups have taken weather forecast models and, and made them climate models. And universities, the universities have access to these models, and particularly in well, in the UK, they have access to the Hadley Centre model, which is what I'm planning to use, um, and in fact have contributed to the development of those models. And in the US, um, National Centre for Atmospheric Research is funded by the National Science Foundation to do work that's for the benefit of the whole community. So, the fact the climate models have been developed can then be used by academics to do experiments and explore things. They'll run them on facilities at NCAR or on the U.S. supercomputing resources. I mean, in, in, but I don't know too much about the U.S. In the U.K., we are running um, climate models on clusters, or to model PC clusters, or national supercomputer resources. The the new one is huge, actually. I mean, it's I think it's a hundred well, it's a hundred million dollar facility, but it's for all of academic research. So the I mean, the projects, let me think. I mean, a, a moderate climate project on that would probably require $200,000 of computing resource, for example. But to run the, some of the science I'm trying to do at the moment using the last generation of climate models, because I'm looking at longer timescales, requires actually quite modest computational resources. Um, let's say, you know, 16 nodes on a cluster for a couple of months. No, I mean, sorry, it's, I mean, the part of the problem with the computational cost of these models goes as about, as about two to the four, if you want, as every time you double the resolution. Yeah. No. Uh, better algorithms. <laughs> that doesn't seem to be defeating us. No, I think it's a hard problem, actually. Yes, you, you've raised an important issue. So, yes, you can't throw more hardware at the problem because it doesn't scale. Um, well, better algorithms that's, that scale on parallel machines would help, actually. Okay, so, so the... The important human influences are greenhouse gases, of which carbon dioxide is the most important one, and aerosol. So the, the way the greenhouse gases are put into the, the models have um, bits of code that, that figures out the heating that comes from changing the composition of the atmosphere. So you just tell the model that the carbon dioxide concentration is whatever it is, and the methane concentration is whatever it is, and it does the calc it, it calculates the heating rates that come from, from that updates the state based on everything else that's going on and advances forward in time. Does that, if I answer that, let me, then I'll talk about the software because it's more complicated. Does that well, clear? So, I mean, when you're, when you're modeling atmospheres, I mean, obviously, you're yep. taking the, you know, the slopes in China. Okay, sorry, no. The, the scenario, the, the climate models don't do anything to do with human changes in China causing emissions of carbon dioxide. What's happened is that there's a, expert group who goes off and scratches their head and 
thinks, given these different possible scenarios of future human development, what does that mean in terms of atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and other, and other stuff? And those are then put straight into the model. Does that? Yes. No, the, 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 the diagram I showed, I'll go and show it here. I think it's this one. No. There, that one. So these three different colors reflect different scenarios of what uh, change, what, how global development, the global economy might develop, and therefore what its consequences are for carbon dioxide emissions and concentrations in the atmosphere. Well, the concentrations of, of carbon dioxide are then, have, have, once they've been worked out by this expert group, are then used to drive climate models to look at the climate response to that thing. I mean, it gets complicated when you start thinking about the interaction with the carbon cycle, because at the moment half the carbon that goes into the atmosphere is put up, taken out of the atmosphere, and the other half stays there, roughly. Uh, if that changes, you'll get changes. But that doesn't, as soon as that doesn't change for these purposes. Did I? Yep. For so, in fact, I'll go back to my. Oh, that's perfect. Here we go. So, this is a uh, state of the art around about 2005 model. So that that's the resolution of those models, a couple hundred kilometers. You can use regional models, which they have a resolution of. 10 to 50 kilometers, where you drive the boundaries with the state taken from this large-scale model and use that regional model to give you regional detail as to how climate change might happen. So that's done quite operationally within the field. Is that ask? I, I was just wondering if that greater accuracy is because of the sensitivity Well, no, because those regional... No, mm, there hasn't been a great deal of systematic exploration of the effect of resolution. So you might say, well, let's do this study and then do another study where we increase the resolution, double the resolution and, and look at the global scale changes. I think in general those, those, though they do make a difference, they are less than the uncertainty that arises from the need still to parameterize. I mean, resolution helps for certain things like better simulation of rainfall, but doesn't seem to be better for, at least we get to very fine resolution of what the, how the, how the, how the, more, what the feedbacks are. Um, yes, happens off Greenland and Antarctica. So it's, where, it's how the deep water and the deep circulations in the ocean are driven. So that's another process that's included in the Yes. Well, the, because the, the things that you care about are, are emergent from the model, if, if you worry about that thing, and you believe the model, and that's the, that's the leap of faith in some cases, I think, you could drive the model with that change and see what the consequences are. And many of my colleagues, for example, have done experiments where they shut down, sorry, numerical experiments, where they shut down the, the circulation, the, the northward circulation in the North Atlantic to see what the effect is. Yeah. So those are the kind of studies you can do with these models. I, you have to ask, is that model reasonable for that purpose, I think. What, increasing carbon dioxide doesn't lead to warming? No. I think all models will show if you increase carbon dioxide, the planet warms. What they will not agree about is the magnitude of that warming. Um, carbon dioxide is, stops heat escaping from the 
atmosphere, and so the, at the atmosphere warms up so it can radiate the same amount of energy back to space again. It's very, the physics behind why carbon dioxide wants planet are, are quite simple. The, the difficulty is these feedbacks. Oh, we're, we're well outside the range of natural carbon dioxide and where it's been for, I think, at least a million years and probably longer. And we're heading for a world where the carbon dioxide levels will be higher than I think anything that's been seen for 50 million years. And I think that we are, if we continue on those, those tracks, those scenarios, assume we're, we're moving into a very different world, a world that hasn't existed for a long time. Are they, are they good? Um, you probably can't really know what's going to happen because things will surprise you. I mean, I think that, that is important. But I think if, if taking that in face value, you would say that models have no capacity to tell you what might happen. So I think yeah. they give you some capacity to predict what might happen as long as they're not missing important processes. And unfortunately, the only way you'll discover you're missing, well, the only way in the past we've discovered we're missing process in complex models is when nature surprises us. Um, no, that, that, those are mostly caused by aerosols, so these little particles, mostly, of which most are um, sulfuric acid droplets. And so that component is included in climate models. And in fact, until we included that, and I think, yes, I, that which was work we started doing in the mid-90s, we couldn't explain what was happening in the observational record. So we need to include those effects in our models to understand what's happened. So I think we do have some. Global dimming has been included in, in models for a while. Okay, the, the R, oh, this is a very old one. The, so the, the reason why water vapor is an um, amplifier feedback, a positive feedback, is that in the upper atmosphere, it, it's a, if, it's constant, if the amount of water vapor increases as the world warms, it's, a, it's like carbon dioxide. It's, it absorbs infrared radiation, so it keeps the planet warmer. Uh, there, ha there was a suggestion that water vapor in the upper atmosphere might decrease under a warmer world because of the exact way in which convection happened. As you say, there have been observations taken around the time of the Pinatubo volcanic eruption, which suggested that actually upper tropical, the water vapor in the upper atmosphere was doing roughly what we expected. Does that? Well, no? so, so what, was the, what was the negative? So the, the negative feedback would be if you had, in a warmer world, if you had less water vapor in the upper atmosphere. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. So water vapor near the, the atmosphere near the bottom is, is got so much water vapor in it that the infrared, radiation, infrared radiation can't escape anyway. It's, it's up in the upper bits of the atmosphere where, that, where that's important. So that's the reason for that. Ninety percent. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. It was the mandate. It was sort of the projections on temperature that was lower. Is that right? Um, there were sort of two things. One was, is the temperature rising? Yep. That was that, no, no, that was, that was very likely or so without, any, without any doubt. I, I can't quite remember the language, sure. but there was some essentially that the observations were, you know, there was no yeah. doubt that the temperature climate wasn't changing. Was, there was no doubt the climate was changing, I think. But the likely was attributing that to human influences. Uh, 
it's, it's, it's quite noticeable, particularly for eruptions like Pinatubo. There's a clear cooling signal there year, year after that eruption. They linger for one to two years, and if you get a load of them together, they can have a climatic effect. In, in fact, the the effect of all the eruptions, that, of na the actual effect of natural forcing, we, well, we believe, because of all those volcanic eruptions at the end of the 20th century, would have been to cool climate, not warm it. By not by very much. And yeah, I think volcano is an important driver of natural climate variability. Send Al Gore around every time. Um, yeah, that's the. I, well, I'm starting with new students. So I'm beginning. To, I I wonder if there's room for having quite simple models where you where you can basically say to people this is the basic way in which a climate model works. And I wouldn't necessarily even go that far, and and just let them play with it. I'm I'm. I think, though, that people are willing to play with models on the web probably don't need much convincing about climate change. It's it's the people who are, let's say, not terribly well educated or don't just have time to think about it or don't want to think about the consequences because it involves quite big changes. Um, so I, I wonder if Mr. Gore should just visit them more frequently and convince them.